The Trumpton Podcast Company proudly presents A Trumpton Christmas Carol by Mike Dix and the spirit of Charles Dickens. Stave 1. Marley's Ghost Boris Alexander de Peffel Johnson Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Unless, of course, he was on holiday, avoiding his responsibilities as the Member of Parliament for Uxbridge. Either way, as far as Rishi Scrooge was concerned, Johnson Marley was absolutely dead. Rishi Scrooge and Johnson Marley had been partners in power for years, you see, until Rishi had stabbed Johnson Marley in the back by revealing he was a greedy, egotistical and dangerous idiot, something the British people had worked out many years before. For Rishi Scrooge was a very greedy fellow himself, and making money for him and his chums always came first, and they'd decided that it was in their best interests for him to replace Johnson Marley as Prime Minister. So here we are, it's Christmas Eve, and here's Rishi Scrooge in his office in No. 10 Downing Street, keeping an eye on his clerk, Charles Cratchit III, who was busy counting Rishi Scrooge's money. Um, one million, two million, three million... Just then, the door burst open, and in stepped Sir Keir Starmer Scrooge, who, for the purposes of this tale, is Rishi Scrooge's nephew. "'Merry festive celebratory period, Uncle Rishi,' cried Sir Keir. "'Bah!' said Rishi Scrooge. "'Humbug! Oh, don't be so grumpy, Uncle. "'If I had my way, any woke, tofu-loving, anti-growth idiots "'who won't call Christmas Christmas any more should be sent to Rwanda,' said Scrooge. "'Well, Merry Christmas, then, Uncle.' Bah! Christmas is humbug too, said Rishi Scrooge. What have you to be merry about, anyway, nephew? You mean, apart from the opinion polls? Well, I've always seen Christmas as as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of, in the long calendar of the year, when people seem to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as, as if they were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys in dinghies crossing the channel. Uh, bravo! Well said, said Cratchit the Third. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you will be keeping Christmas by losing your situation, Charles Cratchit. Then how will you pay back your late mother's sixteen million pounds of debts for covering up your brother's noncing? And you, Sir Keir, are quite a powerful speaker he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder if you don't go into Parliament. Uh, nonsense, uncle. Look, come and dine with us. Tomorrow, we're going to have a curry and a, and a beer night, just like we did with Angela in Durham, chirped Sir Keir. I'd rather have cake with my old partner and his awful wife, and I've never done that, nor never will, nephew. Good day to you. As Sir Keir left the office, he let in Mr Rees Mogg, who was rattling a collection tin. "'Ah, am I addressing Mr Johnson Marley, sir?' said Rees Mogg. "'You are not. Johnson Marley was my partner. "'But he is dead to me now, and he should be to you, sir,' replied Mr Scrooge. "'Well, I have no doubt that his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner.' Rishi Scrooge shivered at the word liberality, partly because he didn't know what it meant, and partly because it sounded awfully woke. Mr Rees Mogg continued to drone on. At this festive season of the year, Mr Scrooge, said Mr Rees Mogg, taking up his tin, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute bankers and hedge fund managers, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many hundreds are in want of common necessities, such as butlers and Nannies, since we left the EU. Thousands are in want of common comforts like foie gras and caviar, sir. Are there no open prisons? asked Rishi Scrooge. Oh, there's plenty of prisons, said Rees Mogg, laying down the tin. But we all know these chaps never go to prison. And are there no tax havens in the Bahamas for them to live? demanded Scrooge. There are still, returned Rees Mogg. I wish I could pretend that there were not. Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. 
I have plans to move there myself in 2024. The tax haven in the Bahamas, not the open prison, that is. But, sir, we are raising a fund to provide food, prostitutes and cocaine for these bankers, who continue to have their bonuses capped at only 200% of their salaries, and I implore you to contribute from your huge personal wealth. Well, I don't make merry myself at Christmas, sir, and I can't afford to make lesser bankers merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population, just as Hancock did with the pensioners during Covid. Now, good day to you, sir. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue his point, Smog left the office. Rishi Scrooge resumed watching Charles Cratchit the Third counting his assets, feeling rather smug about himself. "'You'll be wanting tomorrow off, I suppose, Cratchit,' said Rishi Scrooge, for tomorrow was Christmas Day. Uh, "'If it's convenient, sir,' said Cratchit the Third. "'It is not convenient, Cratchit, but I suppose you must have the day off, at least to make your annual speech that no one's going to listen to.' "'Be in early the next day to make up for it,' said Rishi Scrooge, as he buttoned up his coat and left Number 10 to trudge through the slush to the foggy door of Number 11, where he lived in a luxury apartment at our expense. Normally, Rishi Scrooge barely thought about his ex-partner, Johnson Marley, so it surprised him as he raised his key to the old door to see the large knocker transform into the bloated face of Johnson Marley. The face was not angry or, or fearsome. In fact, it looked at Rishi Scrooge as Johnson Marley had always done, with puzzlement as to why the waiter from the local Indian restaurant was in his office. Its hair was tousled, purposefully, as if to give the impression that he'd just climbed from a lover's window and had fallen into the shrubbery chased by her husband. Rishi Scrooge's blood ran cold, but he opened the door and he walked into number 11, shouting, Bah! Then humbug! as he did so. He climbed the staircase to his flat at the top of the building and after checking under the table, the sofa and the big screen TV to make sure he was indeed alone, he put on his Armani nightshirt and his Gucci slippers and settled into his chair to watch Strictly. Just as he did so, he heard a terrible clanking noise from the stairs as if someone or something were dragging heavy chains up them. The sound stopped abruptly at his door with a loud clunk. The colour drained from his face as a ghostly fat blob appeared to be bumbling through his door, chains clanking as it did, and moaning, Woff! 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 Upon its coming in, the television blurted out as though it were a guest presenter on Have I Got News For You. I know him! It's Johnson Marley's ghost! It screeched. The ghost, for that is what it seemed to be, was transparent, allowing Rishi Scrooge to see the contents of its bowels, which was not a pretty sight. Its head was wrapped in a bandage, tucked under its chin, which barely kept its scruffy hair in place, and its rotund body had a, a chain wrapped around it that dropped to the floor like a tail. Rishi Scrooge observed that the chain had cash boxes full of roubles, used condoms and PPE contracts attached to it. "'What or who are you?' demanded Rishi Scrooge. Oh, "'In political life, I, I was your partner, uh, Boris Johnson Marley.' said the gelatinous Bob. Humbug, said Rishi Scrooge. You're more likely to be a figment of my imagination, brought on by an undigested bit of suspicious cheese that Truss left behind, and I ate for my supper. At this, the ghost raised a terrible whoa and removed the bandage from its head, allowing its lower jaw to drop to its man boobs, dribbling spittle all down its shirt. Mercy! Boris! Now I know it's you, cried Scrooge. Why are you chained so? asked a trembling Rishi Scrooge. I, I wear the chains created during my premiership, said the ghost. It is made of the things that mattered to me the most. Not duty or, or kindness or compassion, but roubles, condoms and fame. I am doomed to wander the streets of Soho, carrying this burden and unable to touch young women, Johnson Marley wailed. You are forging your own similar chain, Rishi, although there's far less condoms, mainly it's just cash boxes, he went on. Rishi Scrooge looked with horror and fell to his knees. 
How can I avoid this terrible fate, Johnson Marley, he cried. Well, I'm here to warn you, just as Cleopatra did for, for Julius Caesar, that you still have a chance to avoid my fate, Rishi. A chance that I have gained for you in an oven-ready deal that I did with the afterlife, said Johnson Marley. Oh, you are always, always a good friend to me, Boris, said Rishi Scrooge. No, I wasn't, snapped Johnson Marley. I bloody hated you. Nevertheless, thank you for doing such a deal for me. Now, what must I do for my part? inquired Rishi Scrooge. Um, well, you're going to be visited by, by free spirits, or ghosts if you like, who will show you terrible things. Rishi Scrooge looked shocked. Is, is, is that the oven-ready deal for salvation that you mentioned, Boris? Rishi demanded in a faltering voice. It is, replied the ghost. Well, I, I think I'd, I'd rather not, said Rishi Scrooge. Whoa, I'm afraid I didn't really read the small print, Rishi. Best deal I could do at the time, said the ghost. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path that I tread. And now I've committed to it, so you're doomed to go through with it. "'Expect the first ghost tomorrow when the bell tolls uh, one-ish,' he said, almost apologetically. "'Expect the second at, at the same hour uh, on the next day, and then, and then the third sometime on Thursday, or something. What?' "'Couldn't I do them all at once?' asked Richie Scrooge. "'No, you can't, you greedy little bastard,' replied the ghost. And with that, the ghost wrapped its jaw back to its head and left through the open window, as if chased by another lover's angry husband.' Rishi Scrooge followed to the window. Desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains just like Marley's ghost. Some, they may well have been guilty governments, were linked together. None of them were free. One wore chains of dead pensioners, face masks and kangaroos' anuses. Rishi Scrooge had no idea who that was. The spirits all seemed to be trying to help the poor of Westminster, but due to their transient nature, they couldn't seem to reach a hand out to help. It was either that, or they were trying to steal the wallets from the poor. It was so foggy, Rishi Scrooge couldn't tell. He shrugged, closed the window, and went to bed, as the hour was late and he didn't like looking at poor people. As he drifted off to sleep, he muttered, Humbug! and closed his eyes wondering why his wife wasn't there. Stave 2, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the smeary, dirty window from the wallpaper Johnson Marley's wife had purchased. He lay there and almost forgot for a moment what had happened before he fell asleep. Then he heard Big Ben striking. Ding dong! One ring and no more. One o'clock in the morning the time Johnson Marley had predicted he would be visited by a spirit. There was a sudden burst of light in his chambers, and Rishi Scrooge was confronted by an unearthly visitor. The glowing apparition was the size of a small child, but it was obviously a middle-aged woman clutching a handbag. It reminded Rishi Scrooge of a tiny Margaret Thatcher appearing in his bedroom, a fantasy he had long harboured since the days of staring at a poster of her in his dorm at Winchester sock in hand. "'Who are you, spirit?' demanded Rishi Scrooge. "'I am the ghost of Christmas past,' said the ghost. "'And, and why are you here, spirit?' inquired Rishi Scrooge. First, stop playing with yourself, you filthy little man. I am here for your welfare,' said the spirit of Thatch. "'Now, take my hand. I am taking you back to the eighties.' She took Rishi Scrooge's hand, and to his amazement they drifted through the very wall of his bedroom and into the swirling fog outside. After some time, they sat down in a field covered in snow. At the bottom of the field lay a familiar building to Scrooge, his old school, Winchester. They passed through its walls and through empty corridors vacated by the boarders for Christmas. There in the corner, huddled up to a radiator and reading a set of accounts by candlelight, was a small boy with shiny black hair. "'Why, it's me, when I was a boy at school!' exclaimed Rishi Scrooge. "'My parents were too busy running their drug business to have me home for the holidays, and anyway, the older boys had tied me to a radiator to make sure that I couldn't leave.' "'Indeed,' said the spirit. "'You were never very popular.' 
let us see another Christmas. And with that, she took his hand and whisked him through the clouds again to settle in Shoe Lane, London. The ghost stopped at a certain office door and asked Rishi Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? said Rishi Scrooge. Well, I, I was apprenticed here. It's the Goldman Sachs offices. They stepped inside and were confronted by a young, earnest-looking Rishi Scrooge himself, reading a set of accounts tied to a radiator. Ha! What fun! My line manager, Mr Fezziwig, would always do that to me, just as the Christmas party was starting. Did he leave you there for long? inquired the ghost. Just long enough to do the end-of-year accounts, said Rishi Scrooge sadly. But if I'm not mistaken, this is the year and the place that I fell in love with the love of my life, Akshata Murti, explained Rishi Scrooge. How did you meet her if you weren't at the party? asked the spirit. Why, I found her there in the accounts, net worth of 730 million quid. What a catch! The scene changed to show Rishi Scrooge, a little older now, with a beautiful young girl, her eyes sparkling with tears, sitting beside him. Do you remember this girl, Rishi? said the spirit of Maggie. I do. She was my actual girlfriend at the time. Belle, I think her name was, replied Scrooge. And do you recall what she was saying to you? asked Thatcher's homunculi. You think only of money, Rishi, said the girl. Money makes you safe and powerful, Belle, replied young Scrooge. And Akshata Murti has bloody loads of it. So sling your hook, you filthy working class slut. I'm going to go and nab me an heiress. I've seen enough spirit, said Rishi Scrooge. A win for Rishi. One more Christmas to see, Rishi, said the ghost. In an instant, the scene swapped to the inside of a house in Newham. Scrooge recognised Belle, older but still beautiful and probably just as poor, sat there surrounded by children playing. A man came into the room laden with presents and toys. The children squealed with joy as they greeted their father and opened their gifts. I saw an old friend of yours today, Belle, said the man. Who? said Belle. Old Rishi Scrooge. I passed his office window, and there he was, tied to a radiator, reading a set of accounts. No sign of his wife, who I think now lives in California. He seemed very alone, possibly the loneliest man alive. But filthy rich, exclaimed Rishi Scrooge. You aren't really getting my point, are you, Sunak? said the ghost of the milk snatcher. Not really. Can we go now? asked an impatient Rishi. Suddenly, Rishi Scrooge found himself alone and back in his bedroom at number 11 Downing Street. He was exhausted from his ghostly trip and full of regret, mainly for not having found a billionaire heiress to marry. He fell into his bed and sank into a heavy slumber, dreaming of squeezing a tiny Margaret Thatcher under his duvet. Stave 3. The Second of Three Spirits Rishi Scrooge was prepared for his next unwelcome visitor. He lay on his bed practising biting put-downs for the next spirit, like Didn't you support Jeremy Corbyn? And I bet you hang out with the ghost of Jimmy Savile. Big Ben interrupted his thoughts by chiming again. Ding dong! That's odd, said Rishi Scrooge. Just one ding dong. The clockworkers must be on bloody strike as well. He peeked out of his bed, but no ghostly visitor appeared. All he could see in the gloom was a warm glow coming from the door in the next room. Rishi Scrooge pulled on his slippers and dressing gown and padded to the door. Just as he reached out to the knob, the door flung itself open, revealing a room not unlike his own, but festooned with Christmas decorations. Wreaths of holly and pine, presents piled high and food, so much food. Turkeys, hams, apples, tubs of Quality Street and twiglets. Sitting in the armchair in front of a blazing fire was a giant of a man who beckoned to Rishi Scrooge and bellowed, Come in! Come in and know me better, man! Rishi Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before this spirit. And though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me! Scrooge reverently did so. The spirit was clothed in one simple green robe, bordered with white fur which gaped open at the chest. Oddly, on his feet he wore football boots, and on his head a holly wreath. 
He had a genial face with sparkling, smiley eyes. Rishi Scrooge looked at the spirit and wondered why he looked so familiar. Then, seeing the three lions emblazoned on the ghost's chest, he realised where he'd seen him before. Aren't you Marcus Rashford? he asked. Maybe, said the ghost. Have you never seen the like of me before? he asked. Well, I'm not really a soccer ball kind of guy, replied Rishi Scrooge. More of a polo and lacrosse chap, he said. Spirit, said Scrooge, submissively. Conduct me where you will. I am a busy man, and you're no way near as attractive as last night's ghost. Tonight, if you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, said the ghost. The next minute, they were in Oxford Street, piled high with snow, angry commuters and shoppers who couldn't get home because of the train strikes. Christmas was in the air, though, as they passed a dozen American sweet shops selling M&Ms and Reese's Pieces for £34 a pack. They turned down a side street called The Mall and found themselves outside the tiny home of Charles Cratchit III, Rishi Scrooge's clerk. Rishi Scrooge and the spirit of Marcus Rashford passed through the closed door and stood in the corner of a kitchen as Charles Cratchit's wife, Camilla I, oversaw 30 servants preparing a modest, by traditional royal standards, Christmas dinner. The pair watched as a swan was stuffed with a turkey, which was stuffed with a chicken, and then a quail, and then they delighted in the smell of a Christmas pudding boiling on the arger. Just as the servants were laying the table and the rest of Charles's family gathered around it, in walked Charles Cratchit III, carrying his son, Tiny Harry, on his back. Harry could walk fine by himself, but he carried a crutch to elicit sympathy in order to publicise his Netflix Christmas special docuseries. Um, a Merry Christmas to all the royal family, said Charles. God bless us all. God bless us all, echoed Tiny Harry. Especially Meghan, because I know you didn't include her when you said us all. The room fell uncomfortably silent. Charles raised a glass, saying, Let us drink a toast to Rishi Scrooge. Uh, for, for without him signing off the sovereign grant every year, none of this would be possible. Speak for yourself, muttered Charles Cratchit's brother Andrew. I don't receive a penny from that list. And why doesn't Uncle Andrew receive any government money? asked Charles of the throng. Because, because he's a nonce, shouted the Royal Cratchits as one. He has a point though, said Camilla Cratchit. Toasting Rishi Scrooge? Why, if he were here, I'd give him a piece of my mind. Inflation and the cost of living crisis mean we've had to cut back to only 30 servants this year. And don't get me started on what happened to the royal yacht, she slurred, for she was already drunk on the Queen Mother's gin. Rishi Scrooge, standing invisible in the corner, felt uncomfortable and ashamed that the mere mention of his name seemed to cast a gloom over the Cratchit's home. But otherwise, they seemed a very happy family, grateful and humble in their tiny house, certainly tiny compared to his one in California. Oddly, for they believed themselves to be unseen, an elderly lady seemed to notice the spirit of Marcus Rashford, and she made a beeline for him. Where are you from? she demanded. The present, replied the surprised spirit of Marcus Rashford. No, but where are you really from? she insisted. Got to go now, you racist old bat, said the spirit, and with that he took Rishi Scrooge's hand and led him through a wall. As Rishi Scrooge left with the spirit, he took a long look at the family, especially Tiny Harry, who was with a film crew interviewing the old woman who'd confronted the ghost and asking her why she didn't like Megan. Outside, it was still snowing, and the shops were bustling with shoppers, who stared at the empty shelves, hoping for some Brussels sprouts or a tin of beans to appear on them. The shopkeepers must have sold out! They'll be very happy, said Rishi Scrooge, imagining a profit and loss spreadsheet and the Christmas shopping statistics from the ONS. Sadly not, replied the spirit. The shelves have been empty for weeks now, due in large part to your ridiculous policy of leaving the EU and the single market. Plus, inflation at the moment means that most people couldn't afford food, let alone luxuries like heating at this time of year. You mean because of Putin's war, surely, spirit, said Rishi Scrooge. The spirit of Marcus Rashford sighed. <sighs> a sigh that echoed through the shoppers with empty bags that bustled around them. As they walked, the spirit reached into his capacious cloak and pulled out a tinned Christmas pudding or a box of after eights and slipped them silently into the empty bags of shoppers. An act of kindness that Rishi Scrooge really didn't understand. 
The spirit stopped and gestured towards a building where a long queue had formed. The windows were lit with candles and inside Rishi Scrooge could see people in high-vis Christmas jumpers handing out food and blankets. See, spirit, said Scrooge, this shop appears to have plenty of stock and a queue of fine British citizens has formed, ready to spend their wealth and grow the economy. Under my government, such places are flourishing and it's only tofu-eating anti-growthers like you who deny it. It's a food and warm bank, said the spirit handing out meagre rations to people who cannot afford the basics of life. There are nurses and teachers in that queue, Scrooge. But in a way, you're right. Such places have grown exponentially during your time in office. You must be very proud of yourself, he said sarcastically. I am, said Rishi Scrooge, as the spirit tugged him away. Soon, they arrived at another Christmas home, this time in Islington, a bright, gleaming room full of people laughing in merriment. One laugh surprised Rishi Scrooge. It was his nephew, Sir Keir Starmer Scrooge, who was telling a story to Angela Rayner and West Streeting about his uncle. He said Festivus was humbug, and he meant it too, said Sir Keir. I invited him for a curry, and he turned me down, as he always does, but I'll invite him every year, whether he likes it or not. Why the fuck do you want to do that? asked Angela. Because I feel sorry for him. No one in his party likes him, his staff hates him, and his wife won't live with him. Plus, it winds him up, said Sir Keir. Let's play a yes or no Prime Minister for fuck's sake, said Angela. In this game, dear listener, someone in this case, Sir Keir, must think of a British Prime Minister, and everyone must guess who it is by asking questions that can only be answered yes or no. Sir Keir began, and rapidly the crowd ran through questions like, Did they win a war? No. Did they get re-elected? No. Were they Chancellor before they were Prime Minister? Yes. It's me, it's me, giggled Rishi Scrooge, joining in the game, despite the fact that nobody in the room could hear him. Is it Gordon Brown, for fuck's sake? asked Angela Rayner. Is it John Major or Jim Gallaghan? said Rachel Reeves. No, no and no, said Sir Keir. It's Rishi Scrooge. Who? said everybody at once. And how they all laughed, except for Rishi Scrooge. He was no longer fond of this game. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Sir Keir, and I would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a beer ready in my hand, and I say, Uncle Rishi Scrooge, long may you stay low in the poles. The spirit of Marcus Rashford took Rishi Scrooge's hand and stepped through the wall to the snowy street outside. As Rishi Scrooge looked up at the ghost, he noticed that he'd aged. His hair had greyed, his face had wrinkled. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Rishi Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight? cried Scrooge. Tonight, at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. I have but one more thing to show you, Rishi Scrooge. The spirit pulled an iPhone from his green cloak and showed it to Rishi Scrooge. On the glowing screen were photos of children that the spirit scrolled through for Rishi Scrooge to see. Who are these wretches? asked Rishi Scrooge. Are they yours? They are everyone's, said the spirit. This one is ignorance, and this one is want. They look to me for school dinners and books because you won't fund them. Have they no refuge or resources? asked Rishi Scrooge. Are there no tax havens or open prisons? said the spirit, turning Rishi Scrooge's own words back upon him. Big Ben chimed midnight, and the spirit was gone, faded away to a far-off land called Qatar. Through the fog, Rishi Scrooge could just make out the shape of a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Stave 4. The Last of the Spirits The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face and its form, and left nothing of it visible save for one outstretched hand. Rishi Scrooge fell to one knee, something he'd learnt from the spirit of Marcus Rashford earlier. "'You are the ghost of Christmas is yet to come,' said Rishi Scrooge. The spirit didn't answer, but seemed to nod which was a relief to this narrator who didn't have to attempt a voice for this particular ghost. You are about to show me shadows of things that have not yet happened, Rishi Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? Again, the spirit just nodded, 
and with a wave of its hand indicated Scrooge should follow it. Despite having spent some time with ghosts recently, Rishi Scrooge trembled at this one and struggled to walk. The spirit waited for a moment for him to catch up. They stepped into the city of London, outside the Bank of England, where a knot of bankers was discussing someone unknown. The spirit pointed towards them, as if to tell Rishi Scrooge to listen in. No, said the great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it. Either way, I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? asked a third, taking a vast quantity of cocaine out of a very large bag. I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first man with a yawn. It's likely to be a cheap funeral, said the man with the red braces. He didn't have any friends left in the city after he lost the election and let Labour introduce the banker's bonus tax. I don't know anyone who'll go. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced man with red braces. I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin yawning again. Left it in the Bahamas, perhaps. He certainly hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. The bankers laughed like drains and strolled away. <laughs> The spirit whisked Rishi Scrooge away to a poorer part of town, inside a scruffy charity shop full of junk and old clothes. A woman came in with a silky bundle under her arm. Oh, what have you got there? A donation? asked the enthusiastic shop assistant. Armani dressing gown and Gucci slippers, said the old woman. They're not mine. The owner's dead. I took them from his corpse while he was still warm. Once again, the spirit led Rishi Scrooge away before he could find out how much the shop would charge for his designer loungewear. This time, they reappeared next to Rishi Scrooge's own bed. A shape was laid out upon it, covered with a silky sheet. There were no mourners, no weeping family, no cabinet members even at his bedside. Who is under the sheet? Rishi Scrooge said, although he feared he knew the answer, but didn't want to believe his fears. Is there no one in London who feels any emotion at this man's death? said Rishi Scrooge, quite agonised. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight, where a mother and her children were sitting staring at the door. A man, young, but looking haggard, stepped in. I'm afraid it's good and bad news, my dear, said the young man to his anxious wife. What's the good news? asked the woman. Did we qualify for extra help for our fuel bills? I'm afraid that's the bad news, dear. In fact, it turns out we have to pay back the last grant we got or we'll be cut off at midnight, sighed the man. Oh no, the children will either perish in the cold or, or starve if we must pay the bill with the money I scraped together for the food, sobbed the wife. So what is the good news, husband? I just found out that the Prime Minister's dead. Hurrah! shouted the family, and how they all laughed. <laughs> <laughs> when I said emotion, I didn't mean that, said Rishi Scrooge to his big cloaked companion. Show me someone who shows sorrow connected with death, said Rishi Scrooge. The spirit took Rishi Scrooge's arm, and once again they found themselves in the home of Charles Cratchit III. This time, however, the house wasn't full of Charles's royal family members. Instead, there was just tiny Harry and his wife, Megan, sitting sadly on his knee on the throne in the middle of the room. "'Remind me how they all died, Harry?' asked Megan. "'Forcing us to become the Queen and the Queen's consort,' she said. "'It was Rishi Scrooge's fault,' said Harry. "'When his poll ratings fell below ten percent, "'he announced he would commission a new royal yacht for Papa. "'The little skinflint pocketed the money himself "'and got a friend to make the yacht from recycled dinghies "'recovered from the Channel. "'Then the whole family were invited on the maiden voyage.' "'Except us,' interrupted Megan. "'Exactly,' continued Harry. "'And inevitably, when the yacht sank, "'there was no one to rescue them "'because Rishi Scrooge had disbanded the RNLI "'and locked up all the volunteers for treason. "'The whole royal bloodline was lost. "'We were the only members of the family alive to take the throne, "'which of course meant we had to cancel our Netflix deal,' "'he said sorrowfully. "'With a swirl of its gown, "'the spirit transported the pair yet again and Rishi Scrooge found himself clinging to the spirit's arm outside number 10 Downing Street. Rishi Scrooge squinted through the window and saw his nephew, Sir Keir Starmer Scrooge, at the cabinet table. The wallpaper had certainly changed, and Rishi Scrooge didn't recognise anyone around the cabinet table at all, much the same way as the British people didn't either. Another swirl of the dreary gown, and they were in a dark, cold graveyard in Westminster. 
The ghost, still silent, pointed towards a simple grave. Trembling, Rishi Scrooge approached it. Rishi Scrooge stopped before reading the stone. Spirit, he said, tell me, are the things you have shown me shadows of things that will be, or things that might be? he asked. The spirit didn't answer. Because if, when you return me, I change my ways, might I avoid this terrible ending? The spirit just pointed to the grave. As he feared, the uncared-for grave marker bore his own name, Rishi Scrooge. Am I that man the bankers laughed at? The one who lay upon the bed? The, the prime minister that died alone and unmourned? He cried. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. Oh no, spirit! Oh no, no! The finger still was there. Spirit! He cried, clutching at its robe. Hear me! I am not the man I was. Give me a chance to improve. Why show me this if I am past all hope? said Scrooge. The spirit did not answer. I will learn from what you have shown me. I have taken note, spirit. I will learn from the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will learn from this and I will change things for the better. As he said this, the spirit nodded and the graveyard around them seemed to shrink and collapse and reveal Rishi Scrooge's bedroom in number 11 Downing Street. Stay 5 the end of it. Rishi Scrooge was excited to see his Armani gown and Gucci slippers were still there, that his body was very much alive and not lying lifeless on the bed. I will learn from the past, the present and the future, Rishi repeated to himself. Oh, Boris, spirits, especially Maggie, and Christmas itself, I have you to thank for this chance to change things, he exclaimed. Running to the window, he flung it open. No mist, no fog, no phantoms. In fact, it was a bright, clear, sunny morning. What day is it? Rishi Scrooge shouted to a small boy who was loitering outside. Eh? replied the boy. What's today, my fine fellow? said Rishi Scrooge. Today? replied the boy. Why, it's Christmas Day, sir. It's Christmas Day, repeated Rishi Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like, of course. Of course they can. Of course. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the shop uh, in the next street but one, on the corner? Scrooge inquired. You mean Tesco Express, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Rishi Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the turkey that was hanging up there? The big one. What, the one that had bird flu, returned the boy. What a delightful boy! Yes, said Rishi Scrooge. That's the one, my boy. It's hanging there now, sir. Nobody wants it for fear of poisoning themselves, replied the boy. Is it? said Scrooge. Is it? Go and buy it. Here's fifty pounds. Get them to deliver it to Sir Keir Starmer Scrooge in Islington, said Rishi Scrooge, with a note attached saying, There's no money left. Ha <laughs> ha! The boy picked up the £50 note and was about to bolt off when Rishi Scrooge stopped him with a shout. And boy, he bellowed, do you know the betting shop next to the Tesco Express? I do, sir. What a marvellous chap, said Rishi Scrooge. Take this betting slip to them and get them to place a bet from my offshore account, said Scrooge, as he threw a hastily scribbled note to the child. And is there half a crown in this for me? inquired the enterprising scamp. No! Now piss off and do as you're told before I get a Met officer to strip search you, you little bugger, replied Rishi Scrooge as he closed the window and got dressed. Rishi Scrooge set off to visit his nephew in Camden Town and as he walked through the streets past the queues for the warm banks and the food pantries, he wished striking nurses and postal workers a merry festivus which made no one feel better about themselves, including him. Reaching his nephew's home, Rishi Scrooge said to himself, I will change everything for the better. The spirits have shown the errors of my ways. The new Rissy Scrooge starts today. He peered through the window of Sakir's living room and saw the half-eaten turkey on the dining table. All around it lay the shadow cabinet, groaning and clutching their stomachs as if in immense oh. agony. Sakir oh. looked up from the carpet where he lay. He was surprised to see the tiny silhouette of his uncle laughing maniacally at their plight before he screwed his eyes closed and breathed his last.
Rishi Scrooge was delighted with himself as he skipped and danced his way home, singing, A second term in 24 is what Dishy Rishi was put here for. The next morning, Rishi Scrooge sat expectantly in his office, staring at the front door. You're late, Cratchit the Third, he exclaimed as the clerk stumbled through the door. Only a few minutes, Mr Scrooge. I had to walk here as there are no train services due to the strikes you've caused, replied Charles. This will not do, said Rishi Scrooge. This will not do at all. Things are going to change around here, he went on, poking Charles the Third in the ribs so hard that he staggered backwards. Then, breaking into a rather insidious smile, Rishi Scrooge bellowed, Merry holiday, us, Charlie! And he clapped him on the back. And I shall give you and your royal family a merrier festimus than you have ever had, my fine fellow, for I have seen the error of my ways. Charles could not believe his eyes or ears, despite the size of the latter. I've ordered you a fine new royal yacht, he said, and from this day on you'll be able to treat your family like kings each Christmas dining aboard it, Rishi Scrooge revealed. Now, light the fire, Charlie, and let's warm this place up. Just then, there was a knock at the door, and upon opening it, Rishi Scrooge saw the small boy he'd sent to Tesco's in the betting shop the day before. Why, hello, my fine fellow, said Scrooge. Did you manage to place that bet for me? I did, sir, and here is the receipt. One million pounds on Tiny Harry becoming our new king by next Christmas, at one thousand to one odds, sir, said the little scamp. And the bookie said, you were odds-on favourite to win the next election after the mysterious death of all the Labour MPs. You see, dear reader, Rishi Scrooge did change after his experience with the ghosts of Christmas's past and present, but especially because of what he learned from the ghost of Christmas future. He would still die, an unpopular and unloved man, but he would have decades in office now, with no opposition, and he'd be considerably richer as a result of his bet on King Harry. From that day onwards, Rishi Scrooge was remembered as a man who knew how to celebrate Christmas, on his own, tied to a radiator, and surrounded by the thing he loved the most, his money. And so, as Tiny Harry said, God bless us everyone, except Uncle Nonce. You have been listening to A Trumpton Christmas Carol, a morality tale for the year 2022. If you enjoyed this, the Trumpton Podcast Company is going to try and produce a number of these podcasts during the year. It would really help if you visited my Ko-fi account, co-fi.com forward slash Mike Dix, and help support me in my work. If you can't, then I hope you enjoyed it and you had a great Christmas. Goodbye. <laughs>